So um, just like in the terrestrial biomes case, right, there are common characteristics. These biomes might be in multiple places, right? We're gonna learn about coral reefs. You can find cor coral reefs in Florida, in the Bahamas, and in Australia. Um, so they might be across the world, but they share certain common characteristics. The most important one being that there is water present. So they can be classified into two different types. You have freshwater biomes and marine biomes. Difference between the two, freshwater has no salt or very, very low amounts of salt. Marine water is going to be salt water. Uh, this is ocean water. So we'll start by talking about freshwater biomes. There are three different classifications of freshwater biomes. The first one is streams and rivers. The important characteristic of a stream or a river is that the water is flowing. So it doesn't stand still. It is continuously moving over time. Uh, streams tend to be sh shallow, not shallow, smaller and narrow. Uh, so this is things like a creek. They carry less water, but often do move at a faster rate than a river does. Um, a river, like the one that you see here in this picture, is going to be wide, carry a lot of water, uh, and tends to move slower. So we have rivers on either side of our island. We know what a river looks like. That is about the size most rivers are. And they're carrying flowing fresh water. So because streams and some rivers move really fast, they don't support a lot of plant life. Uh, meaning that things that root to the bottom don't survive well there because the water sweeps them away. Uh, so they don't tend to have a ton of producers or photosynthetic organisms. Um, but what happens is that leaves and other debris, organic debris, falls into the water and that provides the food, the base of the food web. If you remember, food webs always start with a producer, something that can take in organic molecules and make glucose or some other nutrient that is needed. So it, when you don't have plants or algae that can live, you might have plant debris that falls into the water and gets eaten by fish at the bottom of the food chain. So streams, these narrow bodies of water, eventually can combine together. And when many streams combine together, you get enough water for it to be considered a river. It's, there's sort of no specific rule about when a stream becomes a river, but generally they need to be larger. When it hits the river, the flow of the water slows down, which means that plants tend to grow better in rivers. And these are like rooted plants, rooted meaning they stay in one place. So rivers have more photosynthetic organisms at the base of the food chain uh, and support more varieties of life for that reason. The other thing that happens is sediment. So things like phosphorus or nitrogen or other nutrients that have been carried by the water, when the water slows down, they sink to the bottom, creating a bed that is really nutrient rich and allows that plant life to grow. Um, other way around, streams tend to be faster and rivers tend to move at a little bit of a slower rate. Um, there are some rivers that flow faster. So in a more turbulent river or a stream, one of the things that happens as water turns over is that oxygen can dissolve into the water. If you remember, oxygen is really foundational. So oxygen is really foundational because it's used for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is needed to give us ATP energy, okay, flashback to living environment class. As a result, in rivers or streams where there is a lot of movement, while there may be less plant life, there is a lot of dissolved oxygen that allows many species of fish to live. So you see here a picture of um, salmon. They are in really turbulent waters. Salmon swim upstream in these rough waters and lay their eggs there each year. Um, and this is really important. They need that oxygen for both themselves to survive and then for their young. Okay, so that is streams and rivers. Um, lakes and ponds. So this is our second type of freshwater ecosystem. Lakes and ponds are bodies of water that stand still. So unlike streams and rivers, they're not flowing. So lakes and ponds 
stand still. They're just big bodies of water. We've, many of us have seen them if you've ever been to Central Park, right? There's several ponds. Ponds are divided into regions, and those regions are based on depth and the amount of sunlight that is there. So because of these differences in light, in nutrients, and in temperature, each part of a lake or pond is going to have different sort of organisms that call it home. The first type is known as the littoral zone. This is the outer edge of a lake, it tends to be shallow. If you were to go swimming, this would be the part of the lake that you would be in. Because it is shallow and there's a lot of sunlight, there are plants that are able to grow in the dirt at the bottom, in like the mud at the bottom. And those plants might come out of the water, meaning that they're emergent. They might be submerged completely underwater, but they are rooted to the ground. Um, there's a lot of plant life and most of the pho photosynthetic organisms in a lake or pond are around that shallow outer littoral zone edge. When you move out into the middle of the lake, you move into what's called the limnectic zone. It is too deep for rooted plants, but you do have free floating algae like phytoplankton. These still go through photosynthesis. They're just not a full plant. They tend to be single celled or just a few celled organisms that can float freely and produce glucose and form the bottom of the food chain in the, out, in the open part of a lake. Um, the limnectic zone is as deep as light can reach. In most lakes and ponds, this is the bottom. Light tends to get all the way to the bottom, but in very, very deep lakes and ponds, you might also have something known as the profundal zone where there is no light. Again, this is only a very deep ponds because there is no light, there are no producers and not a lot of plant life if the lake has a profundal zone. The bottom, this muddy zone is known as the benthic zone. It's really rich in nutrients uh, and allows a lot of different life to live there. The final freshwater ecosystem is a wetland. These are areas that are submerged in water for at least part of the year, but unlike a lake, they have plant life that is emergent, meaning that it grows both partly below and partly above water. So this might be certain varieties of trees, things like cattails or some of the, the um, organisms that you see here in this image on the left hand side. They're pretty shallow. Uh, they tend to only be a few feet deep. And because of that, they can support, support a lot of this emergent plant life. So these are things like swamps, marshes, and bogs. Wetlands can be fresh or salt water. We're gonna learn next about some salt water versions of the wetland, but right now we're talking just about fresh water. So if you've ever been to like the Everglades or heard of the Everglades in Florida, this is a freshwater wetland that ranges over a lot of space. Um, this picture here is actually a fun fact. Disney World was built over a swamp. So something that has happened is that swamps are not great for being, for building and for construction. So a lot of swampland and wetland in the United States has, has been filled in or drained and used to create living environments. New York is actually this way. Most of the coast of New York City, including where our school is built, used to be a salt marsh. We'll learn about those next and it was filled in so that we could build over top of it. As a result, a lot of valuable habitat has been lost. Wetlands are really, really diverse. They have a lot of different plant life that can live there, a lot of animal life there. You have both fish. It's an important stop for migrating birds. A lot of birds lay their young in the wetland area as well. Next, we're going to move on and talk about our marine biomes. So like I said, the first is the coastal wetlands and estuaries. So coastal wetlands, similar to freshwater wetlands, are partially submerged areas of land, but unlike freshwater wetlands, they are submerged with salt water. So they tend to be on the coast. Um, so you have things like salt marshes, which are what you see in this picture on the left, estuaries and mangrove swamps. A saltwater marsh is just a wetland that has salt water. It has the emergent vegetation and uh, water underneath at the base of the plants. It is a very, very productive ecosystem. And they're very common where fresh water meets salt water uh, and along coasts. 
In fact, like I said earlier, much of New York used to be salt marshes before the city was developed. What happens is that when the rivers, they carry nutrients with them, and when they meet the open ocean, they drop those nutrients off. So an estuary, which is where a river meets the ocean, has a ton of nutrients, and you have organisms that come from both the freshwater and the salt water to do things like lay eggs and find shelter. So salt marshes are really important for ocean organisms. They swim into the salt marsh to lay eggs or to have their young because the salt marsh creates a more protected environment for the young organisms before they're ready to enter back out into the open, motion, open ocean. Um, and they are super threatened because people, humans, like coastal regions and we like to develop along the coast. And in order to build resorts that are on the ocean, on the coast, we have to fill in wetlands to make you know, your next vacation spot. Similarly, you have mangrove swamps, uh, and that's that picture on the right. Mangrove swamps, mangroves are a type of tree. They grow in a really interesting way. They can grow in salt water, but their roots grow under the water and their trunk is above water. So the roots create this tangled system, and just like the marsh, that's a really protective space. So organisms find shelter there. Lots of fish can live, lay young, and survive there from predators. So you get a really abundant ecosystem in these protected salt mangrove areas. Uh, mangroves are also very threatened and have been cleared in a lot of places, leading to a loss in biodiversity. Next, we've got our coral reefs. Uh, coral reefs are probably the most famous of the marine ecosystems. We have all seen them. We've all heard about them. They require a warm area along the coastline. So we find these primarily in areas close to the equator. We've got big ones throughout the Indian Ocean in the Gulf of Mexico and around Australia, but they occur in other places as well. They get a lot of light in they're in the coral reefs and because they have so much light it allows a lot of plant and algae growth that supports the food chain. They are considered the most diverse marine biome. They're often nicknamed the rainforest of the seas because similar to how on land the rainforest has the most biodiversity that is true of the coral reef in the ocean. So coral is the basis of this ecosystem. Corals are living animals and they have a symbiotic relationship with a certain type of algae. So corals form this hard outer shell out of calcium carbonate and the algae that live on them actually give them their color. And the algae provide food to the coral and the coral provides nutrients back to the algae. And that is the symbiotic piece. So what can happen is that if the algae dies, it leaves the coral without a food source uh, so not only do they turn white, but if the algae death is significant enough, then they lose their color, they lose their life entirely because they rely on the algae as a food source. Uh, and this is happening, uh, yeah, so that's called coral bleaching, and this is happening more and more because ocean waters are warming, and the algae that grow on coral tend to be really, really sensitive. They have a very specific temperature range in which they can thrive, so more and more algae is dying, causing the coral bleaching as ocean temperatures rise. Um, these coral systems, kind of like the mangroves, they have a lot of openings, a lot of space for shelter, which is why you see a lot of small fish that live here, and there's a lot of nutrients available there. Um, these small fish are then going to attract larger predators like sharks and dolphins, and sea turtles that are gonna show up in coral reefs as well. So you have a really complex food web in the coral reef. Um, corals are known as a keystone species. This is a really important vocabulary word. So when you're building something, if you've ever seen an archway, there's a stone at the top, it's shaped sort of like a triangle and it fits right into the top of the arch. That's called a keystone. And it is essential, right? The entire arch structure depends on that stone right in the middle. So a keystone species is a species that without their existence, the ecosystem crumbles. We are finding that coral are the foundation. When the coral starts dying, all the other organisms that live there start leaving to try and find a different home, which is why the threat of the coral ecosystems is so huge 
because if the coral ecosystems die, there are no other similar ecosystems, no similar biome that these fish that call the coral ecosystem home could go to. All right, and our final ecosystem that we're gonna learn about is the open ocean. So the open ocean is similar to a lake divided into zones based on the depth and the amount of light. So along the coast, you have an intertidal zone. This is the amount of space where the tide goes in and out each day. So depending on where you're at, could be big or small, uh, but these are places that go from underwater to above water throughout the day. After that, you have the continental shelf. This is a gentle slope. This is where most coral reefs are found. Uh, and there's still a lot of light here. This is in something called the photic zone. Photic meaning that there's light available and therefore photosynthetic organisms can exist here. You move out into the open ocean, the photo, photic zone continues, but now instead of rooted plants, you have algae and uh, phytoplankton and other flea floating producers. The vast majority of the ocean is the aphotic zone. So this is when you reach a depth where there is not enough light for photosynthesis to occur. Instead here you have producers that use methane and carbon to produce molecules that can be used as food. So they don't do photosynthesis to produce glucose, but they have found ways to use other uh, nutrients to produce food for the bottom of the food chain. The deepest parts of the ocean have the least amount of life because as you can imagine, if you've ever swam down in a pool, the more water that's on top of you, the more weight. So the pressure at these depths of the oceans is so great that you need really, really specially adapted organisms to survive there and organisms that can survive without the existence of plants and eat these other producers. Uh, so that is the open ocean. Any final questions? <laughs>